uh, we, our first session is about law, democracy, and society. We will have here uh, Thomas Reuter from Germany, me, Sergio Bittar from Chile, Edon Gordillo from, from Brazil, Alessia Malacani from Italy, Juana Branda from Romania, and uh, we wait, he is not yet here, Winston Nagan from the United States. So now I would like to introduce to you Thomas Reuter. He will be the first speaker. I would like you only uh, explain about the rules of our panel. Uh, each uh, panelist has uh, 15 minutes in total to, to, to do this presentation. And he can directly share our point files or Word files or PPT, uh, PDF files uh, on the screen. And I will uh, advertise when 10 minutes is reached and when only two minutes and when the time is finished. And I, I would like to ask all the panelists that uh, let's try to respect the time because we can't uh, stay too much long and stay too much at the, the session. It will be, it will be tired uh, for, for the audience. So let's start. I'd like to introduce Thomas Reuter. For all of you, Thomas Reuter is a fellow of our academy. He is in the head of the project uh, of the World Academy in Managing Pandemics. Uh, he is an anthropologist at the University of Melbourne with a, with a research focus on Indonesia, sustainable food systems, and on transformative social, social change. He is on the board of the World Academy and past chair of the World Council of Anthropological Associations and a frequent advisor to international organizations and national governments. So thank you very much. Yeah, Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Zalo, for your kind introduction. And I'll, I'll try and share my screen now. Then we can uh, start. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of the COVID uh, pandemic on human security and also uh, the lessons that we might learn from it. Now, initially, this pandemic seemed to be relatively indiscriminate an external shock, he might say, because the direct impact of the virus um, was indiscriminate. Nobody on this planet had any immunity to it. But, and furthermore, apart from the original uh, victims in, in Wuhan in China, by mid-April uh, last year, the demographic group with, with the largest viral infection risk were the privileged jet-setting international elite and their social contacts. This explains the instant and serious global recognition that the crisis received as soon as it expanded beyond China. Somewhat further along, however, it became evident that the, the variable stringency of public health measures uh, such as social distancing, mask wearing, and so on, and the level of pre-existing health system capacity, such as intensive care beds, uh, ventilators per capita, and so on, constituted key drivers of infection and mortality, respectively, and that these dif uh, differed greatly across nations. The impression, nevertheless, uh, remained that COVID did not discriminate in the usual ways, Notably, in fighting the virus, uh, some countries, some relatively poor countries like Vietnam, for example, outperformed some of the richest countries, such as the US and UK, largely because of the policy, policy failures of the latter. And also, um, it so happened that the climate uh, uh, was not as, uh, it didn't spread as quickly because 
most developing countries have a warmer climate and a more useful population, both of which uh, 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 held the, the virus somewhat in check initially. But uh, this impression of COVID-19 as an indiscriminate threat is false, nevertheless. Like all other crises, I will argue, this pandemic is both revealing and deepening an underlying crisis that is set to outlive the pandemic, and that's the global crisis of social injustice. Disadvantaged populations everywhere were soon affected disproportionately by the pandemic. Unsafe workplaces are the workplaces of low paid workers, for example, in the meat processing industry. Limited access to health care, poor diet or malnutrition, and uh, uh, frequency of pre existing med medical conditions, all these together have led to a much higher percentage of fatal outcomes among disadvantaged populations, even in wealthy countries. And in the current stages of the pandemic, uh, inequality expresses, expresses itself as variable access to vaccines, as this map shows. That's uh, just, just recent, recent current status. So initially some 80% of all doses of the first available vaccine, uh, BioNTech, Pfizer, for example, were claimed by just a few rich countries. And the similar pattern uh, applies to all other vaccines as well. However, um, these health and healthcare related inequalities pale in comparison with the different economic impact of COVID. And it, is, it is here that the tragic consequences of inequality in a crisis situation become fully visible. Economic disruption due to COVID has reduced the food security of millions of people and led to a rap rapid increase in poverty. Food availability in some places was hit by disrupted production and supply change, chains, but more often the problem was simply affordability caused by a sudden loss of employment and other income. In the mainstream daily newspapers, however, we look in vain for a leak table comparing the number of deaths across countries that are caused by COVID-induced food insecurity. That kind of news is not seen as relevant to elite and middle-class news readers uh, in wealthy Western nations. The latter are the worthy victims of the crisis, while the poor are not worthy of attention, it seems. Indeed, they must be hidden to conceal the crime of passive manslaughter committed against them because hunger equals poverty. No, okay. Can I show that? Yeah. And this, this uh, uh, slide illustrates this relationship very clearly. It's also not considered news because it's a kind of an old hat. Hundreds of millions of people have long been food insecure, even when global food production was in surplus. And until 2014, we could hide our shame behind the fact that poverty and hunger figures were at least shrinking. Since 2014, however, serious climate change impacts and other factors have led to a global rise in hunger by 18% even before COVID. And under COVID's economic impact, poverty has been skyrocketing so that additional hunger seems now set to kill more people than the virus itself. While for some, the corona-associated shutdowns of economic activity were a minor inconvenience for others. It impact, the impact on their livelihoods was devastating or even life-threatening. Life Around the world, people in low paid and unstable employment and without household savings were the most likely to become instantly food insecure, not to mention housing, education, and health insecurity. The UN World Food Programme estimates that the number of people experiencing crisis level hunger rose to 270 million by the end of 2020, and uh, an increase of 82% in one year. Oxfam estimates that by the end of 2020, some six to 12,000 people died each day 
from additional hunger due to the pandemic. And this crisis could persist in developing countries for a decade or longer, when hopefully we have long overcome the virus. The huge inequalities in national crisis response capability also. Developing nations don't, they have very large proportions of workers in precarious employment, like India, for example. Their governments lack the financial reserves to support them. In India, the demand for support for families made insecure by un unemployment is much greater than in the US, for example, but there aren't the resources to, to, to match folks, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, a response on the scale of the 2.2 trillion US dollar CARES Act, which Congress, US Congress passed in March, 2020. And what is particularly worrying about the situation in developing countries is that of uh, September 2020, 84% of the IMF loans were encouraging, even requiring countries to adopt austerity measures in the aftermath of the health crisis. Such austerity measures could entrench the new levels of poverty. In short, loans may increase the capacity of poor countries to respond in the short term, but in it may come at the expense of increasing the secondary economic impact uh, and, and, and that means more poverty. So apart from income loss, another issue is rapid local price increases in food. Now this in some shows the food spikes in 2020 uh, in a number of uh, badly affected countries. Now, in, for example, in South Sudan, uh, due, uh, due to COVID restrictions, conflict and climate change events, uh, together there were enormous increases. The average retail price of wheat, for example, doubled. And in November 2020, the FAO named four famine hotspots, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, Sudan, Yemen, were among them. Uh, and, uh, and yet, um, also a recent ISC report estimates that overall, the number of lives threatened by acute hunger is expected to double due to this crisis. This is huge. And 2021 is predicted to go down in history as a year of famine on a scale we have not seen for decades. Okay, and this is, of course, in, in many of these countries on this list uh, are ones that are also heavily affected by climate change, uh, a global problem for which these populations bear almost zero responsibility, but which disproportionately impacts on them already. And this is where social injustice and environmental injustice combine and reinforce one another. On the other, the other side of the story, stories, of course, that the rich have been doing very nicely uh, uh, from, from the pandemic. Uh, for example, American billionaires increased their net worth by 30% in this year, in this last year, uh, because of the massive stimulus and, and flow of, 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 of a, you know, a tidal wave of new money into assets, uh, as most of you would be aware. So if, if that new, new COVID-induced wealth increase of the, just the 10 richest billionaires were to be uh, distributed, uh, according to Oxfam, it would be enough to prevent anyone on earth from falling into poverty, as well as pay for vaccinating every human being on the planet. But instead, what we see is that inequality has risen this last year in every country on earth, for the first time at this simultaneously that is Thomas the so, time is over already over but please finish okay let me finish um, now the question is what can be done let me let me just conc some conclusions first of all um, uh, the impact the economic impact and the poverty caused by covid could be reduced or the, the from perhaps lasting a decade to just uh, two or three years, according to the World Bank, with the right policy. 
And we see here that, you know, the way an external shock affects a society is that there are certain areas, certain subsystems that are immediately impacted, but the others are impacted indirectly. And this is what I've been uh, trying to explain. Now, um, if, if the, there are some measures are introduced then uh, uh, to reduce inequality, then the, the impact of the crisis in terms of hunger and poverty could be greatly reduced. So it will it'll make all the difference. And uh, if, if we don't, I mean, this, this is a rational way of responding to these crises. It's not about charity. It's not about uh, uh, compassion alone, though surely we, we should have compassion with those people affected, but there's also indirectly, there are ways in which, such as migration, ways in which everyone will be affected by the consequences of this rising poverty. So it's very much a rational cause of action. And uh, so, and I think it's it's surprising though, if you look at some of the reports that have come out on the, on the, uh, on the crisis from the International Science Council, for example, a 53-page re report only mentions inequality once in passing. That's not good enough coming from science. As rational people, we should, we should urge policymakers to tackle inequality because it's the rational thing to do. Therefore, I think uh, there's, there's much evidence uh, to prove that with the right policies, inequality can be reduced and environmental protection too is largely a matter of political will. Therefore, as scientists, we should insist we must have social solidarity and environmental justice, not Hunger Games. And we've all seen the Hunger Games symbol, you know, people in Myanmar using, it's a, it's a, a bit of a meme of our times to, uh, to, that stands for this kind of solidarity that we should also get behind. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, all the questions, uh, we will receive some questions from YouTube and from the audience here at Zoom. Yeah. Uh, and at the end, we can uh, send it to the speakers and they will be able to answer all the questions, let's just, let's follow the program. Now it's me, it's my time to speak. I would like to share with you direct my exposition. My first work is about economics. Uh, economics is defined as uh, the study of choices in the face of scarcity. And the governments take care about scarcity, of scarcity. Uh, governments will have laid to induce or provide activities related to the production, distribution, and consumption of scarce goods. And my point is, my contribution to the debate is uh, if scarcity is removed from the horizon assessed by individuals in a society, or if individuals do not see the imminence or real possibility of being placed at undue disadvantage due to scarcity, there are spaces for governments to promote the distribution of a resource surplus, and others, the needs of less favored social groups, or create situations of more social equality. We will call this government posture as a promoter of solidarity. But when uh, these surplus resources diminish, or when there is a market risk to individual wealth, employment, 
or access to scarce goods. Governments are sought to ensure stability or the status quo. So I put in my PowerPoint these two kinds of posture as promoter of solidarity is the, the posture one or the posture two as a promoter of status quo. And uh, this second posture is like, uh, it's more important, more, the most important is to preserve, to maintain, to protect. And in this kind of thing, in this kind of posture, for instance, it's very usual. Uh, the government's fight against uh, immigration, control immigration to guarantee domestic employment for nationals, even if creating physical walls or encourage the population armament uh, with the facilitation of acquisition of personal weapons to increase the feeling of individual, physical, and uh, and the patrimonial security, etc. So we call this second posture as individualistic posture, individualist posture, in contradiction with the fraternal, fraternal posture, the promoter of solidarity. And uh, I, I would like to, to, to say that I'm speaking about left wing and right wing governments, basically. I can associate uh, left wing governments uh, with the figure of a promoter of solidarity, and right wing movements as a promoter of state quo. Left wing governments tend to be linked with the ideas of fraternity and solidarity acted through social reform. And right wing governments are often attached to an emphasis on security and individual protection, acting through individual development as a basis for the social development. The idea basically is the individual development will create the social development, is the idea of the right wing uh, posture. And uh, I, I would like not to criticize. Uh, exactly this kind of posture because it depends on the circumstances. It depends on uh, the wealth that will be able to be distributed if there are resource surplus or not in a society. It depends on the moment. So there is no right or wrong about it. And what happened? The COVID-19 pandemic found counters with left-wing or right-wing governments. And uh, some countries started with the, against the, the dissemination of the pandemic to adopt uh, a lot of measures. And uh, this, this posture of the government has a direct relationship with the kind of uh, measures that they adopt. Uh, they vary enormously. Uh, governments were forced to enact lockdowns. We know that lockdowns are very unpopular measures with high economic costs, potentially generating unemployment, loss of jobs, loss of income. Uh, but this idea of lockdown is basically based on the idea of solidarity, of common sacrifice. Uh, there are even initiatives to, for the approval of taxes on large fortunes aimed to gather resources to find against the COVID-19, the wealth tax, Argentina, Chile, Bolivia, some North American states like uh, uh, California, where the Democrats predominate the United States. And we see social isolation, limits of circulation and so on. As uh, there's all of these postures are postures of solidarity, even with the costs associated with them. But governments with uh, individualistic posture, the right wing 
governments. Uh, try to, to imagine the market or the economic reasons. Uh, very, uh, they are very concerned about them. And sometimes they put themselves against the lockdown for the market, for the job, for the enterprise, for the economy. And uh, for they bet with the fear of loss of jobs and income. The government, uh, it's, uh, for me, it's a, a kind of uh, political calculus. The leader imagined that uh, if he is for the market, at the end, will be in the arm of the population, uh, carried by the people, because uh, they protected the jobs, the economy, the market, the store, the, the, the money, and so on. So the idea sometimes was to, to be for the market, to, to not agree to not with the severity of the epidemic. Sometimes they minimize the risks of COVID-19. Uh, Trump has the ability to to face it, sometimes even with the use of drugs of very controversial clinical efficacy like uh, ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. Uh, some leaders told us that it's inevitable. Everyone will contract COVID. Most will suffer, some will die. Let's go ahead. Uh, and uh, it's even we can see minimizing the risk, leaders show in public the deliberate absence of the use of protective masks, in addition to attending and participating in agglomerations. Uh, if, you, if you see right wing and left wing in the United States, you will see that the protection masks became an external identification sign of the ideological position of the politician. Democrats carried, Republicans did not. And negationism in relation to the vaccine is directly related to the negationism in relation to the pandemic. Individualistic governments are hesitant to adopt effective and quick measures, and they are criticized for that. They insisted on speeches about the existence of unwanted side effects with vaccination. Our president in Brazil declared that uh, he is right wing. Uh, uh, Spectrum uh, declared that he will not take the vaccine to avoid transforming himself into an alligator. So here in Brazil, when someone took the vaccine, they say that he will become an alligator. He will be an alligator. They incentive sometimes drug regulatory agencies to demand rigorous tests on the effectiveness of the vaccine. Well, we can see with uh, the position the government, the inclination, the spectrum of the governments, how they deal with the, the pandemic of the COVID-19. And uh, it's not a, 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 a realistic calculus, but it's a political calculus for the market or for solidarity. It's a choice that they have to take and the population uh, is influenced by the positions or decisions of their leaders. And it's my, my contribution today was more exercise of political science. Thank you a lot for your attention. And let's, any questions we can discuss at the end. I would like now the next speaker Sergio Vitar from Chile. He will speak about the threats and opportunities for democracy in Latin America. 
our colleague Sergio Bilta is a member and now resident senior fellow at the Inter-American Dialogue, where he directs the Global Trends and Future Scenarios Project, a member of the Board of Advisor of the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, Mr. Com, President of the Conservo Chileno de Prospectiva Estrategia, Estrategia in Chile, he served as Minister of Mining under President Salvador Allende, 1973. He was elected President of the Party for Democracy in three occasions, 1992, 1997, and 2006. Senator in Chile, 1994, 2002. He served also as Minister of Education under President Ricardo Lagos and Minister of Public Works under President Michele Bachelet. And uh, I have the honor uh, to introduce and give you the floor, Mr. Sergio Vita. Welcome here with us. Your mic is closed. It's open. Open, open. Julius, thank you. Thank you, Saul. Well, let me thank first your invitation uh, from the World Academy of Arts and Science, invitation of Saulo, and also my friend Neantro Saavedra, who's with you now. And uh, I'm very happy to be with you after listening to your presentation and the one by Thomas Reuter. And I will be based in my, my comments on the two of your two presentations because they emphasize the issue of inequality and also the issue of the state to face what is going on. My presentation will be centered in two main uh, points. Refer to Latin America, mostly thinking in the future after what we are living now. Uh, and those are based on the work that we have been doing at the IDEA, the Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, on the future of democracy, the threats to democracy. And there is a report that is coming that would be of your interest uh, in a few months called the Global State of Democracy, uh, with a chapter on Latin America that will come out in a few months. That's the second one that is, uh, has been published the world analysis. And the, the other th basic uh, elements that I will present are, are going to be published in a book that we wrote with two other friends, one Mexican and one Colombian, all of them working on foresight in Latin America to see what are the possibilities that are open now. And if we take the opportunity, we can make changes. My first point concerns that overcoming what we are living now needs reinforcing democracy. That all reforms should be an integral part, a coherent part of the process of change, but ensuring democratic governability. In that sense, we have been defining the concept of democratic governability as the following one. That comes out from the work we have done on transitions to democracy and the need to, to have a, a stronger procedural and cultural elements of democracy to be reinforced in order to achieve results in any case, in any transformation process that is pushed for the future. So the idea is that democratic government governance is the quality of a political system of generating legitimate governance, elected by the people and in fair elections, capable of effectively providing economic and social progress. The, the delivery issue is crucial to, to legitimize this process. Inclusion and sustainability, more equality and citizen participation. Democratic governments involves a leadership capable of leading a process without rupture or interruption, which runs along institutional and peaceful path.
paths within the framework of a rule of law and is supported by an electoral and parliamentary majority. It's not the case in most of our countries. And finally, its strength is increased by a strategic narrative pointing to a desired and shared horizon and with good governance, capable of meeting basic needs and aspirations of the most vulnerable sectors and citizens who feel left behind or left out of the benefits of economic prosperity. So the basic idea, even that if that definition appears to be a little utopian, you need to have views of what you want to achieve in order to move in that direction. So the basic concept is that threatening democracy, as is the case now, will make more, much more complicated the way out of the crisis that we are living now. That's the one of the, my, my first uh, definition. So you cannot do that only from a technical point of view or purely scientific point of view without entering to, in the concept of democratic governability to achieve results. And then the issue of how you strengthen your democracy, and I would say a few words about that. The second point concerns that based on most of the diagnostics that have been represented until now, we need to present a strategic view of the future, a long-term view, in order to mo motivate the strength of a change and social forces and political forces. You need ambitious transformations. And I think what I've been perceiving in all those countries in Latin America is that the pandemic has opened new opportunities that were blocked. And you can even without being uh, non-sensitive what, what has happened, a sort of blessing in disguise. So it has opened possibilities that if there is a vision of the future and enough political and, uh, force, you can achieve results. So if you don't include and introduce hope in this task, you will not make big changes as you need to do to confront what we are having now exacerbating what we had before. So now what could be these major changes for the future? And in, in all the works we have been reviewing and doing and, and, and working on that, at least I would like to mention the following one that would, should be introduced in all our perspectives. First, the construction of a new social pact, a new social contract. And that will include a stronger state, not a bigger state, new instruments, but basically focusing in the provision of basic goods and services in education, health, housing, pensions, and security. And moving towards some, a, a view of universal digital access also. So in that sense, how to build that, how to increase inclusion uh, and moving perhaps to the pro progressive basic income concept uh, and, and also on women's rights and, and paying care, the work that most women do. And also considering the effects that digitalization will have on the on, on employment. That's a very critical issue, immediate and med in, in medium term. Also, the concept of the social debate to discuss the way to build that with all political sectors and pushing for consensus. And, uh, and one basic element would be the transformation of the public health system. That, that probably will be the first stage of the building of this social, new social path. And the other big issue is tax reform and international resources to, to finance this, this process. Now, a second basic element of the transformation is the consolidation of democracy now and the, the, the deepening of democracy in the future. And then we have emphasized mainly how to improve the electoral system and democracy elections, democratic elections. Without that, 
There is no democracy, no legitimacy to democracy. The control of states of emergency, pushing for dialogue and political participation, and new forms of, of consultation and participation, and also the limits to the military as elements to, to control order, public order and the reform of the police in view of the big increase of social protests that will happen in Latin America as a, as a democratic expression, but that may be invo uh, involved and infiltrated by uh, political violence. So a third major thing, uh, factor uh, and part of this major transformation is the issue of a change in the productive structure of Latin America. We, we are very, very backward on that sense. So it has to be considered as part of the scheme. And finally, I would say the issue of uh, the global view of what is going on and how Latin America can play uh, some, some role on that. The point is that we need a voice, a one voice, coordinated voice of Latin America in a situation what now, as we perceive it, that's very fragmented without relevance at all in what would be the rules of the global system that will be uh, will be built in the future. Uh, and on that sense, uh, I, I just want to, to mention the fact that we have this year the American Summit 2021, probably it will happen. Could we think in terms of an hemispheric agreement around democracy and human rights? The Democratic Charter signed in 2001 will be, have 20 years anniversary this year. So can we rethink what we have done in Latin America? The G20 group, there are three Latin American countries there with no connection among each other. Could we advance on that and to have a one's voice on that? The issue of <laughs> that's good. The issue of U.S. and China. Should we have a common view on the bipolarization and how to multilateralize this this process, and also the re relation with the European Union on human rights and democracy? So that's a very important issue. And of course, on this one view of Latin America, the issue of international finance, the role of IMF, the role of the of the World Bank. Let me just finish that with, with this point. Uh, the force of a new proposal for transformation and a new narrative could inspire a political reform and a political transformation in Latin America. And that should permeate political parties, government programs, national debates. We are facing this year until 2000. 2023, in the next two, three years, the super cycle of elections. All Latin American countries will have elections. So my point is that an emphasis on the govern democratic governability and on big transformation and introducing those concepts in those programs, in parties, in the debate, national debate, I would say that it's an important opportunity to get out of this crisis and to move towards a more a desired and positive future uh, by all the region, of course, adapting the situation to each of one of our countries. So that's my, my uh, those are my two, my two points that I wanted to reinforce in this presentation to you in a positive perspective of what we can do if we really face what is going on and we have hope and we present a transformation program that could be concentrated and discussed with public dialogue and deliberation in our countries. Thank you. Obrigado. Gracias. Thank you, Professor Sergio. And uh, let's uh, discuss at the end. Let's follow the program. I would like to introduce now Eron Gordilho. Eron Gordilho is PhD in law at the Federal University of Pernambuco, Brazil, postdoctoral studies at the Ecole des Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris, postdoctoral studies at Pace University Law School, New York, United States. Uh, he, he is law professor at the Federal University of Pays and also at the Federal 
Catholic University of Salvador. And uh, he is also fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science. And uh, the floor is yours, dear Edon, please start. Okay. Um, thank you, Professor Saulo, Professor Gary Jacobis, and, and Professor Neandro, Daniela, Professor Jamila, and all the fellows of um, World Academy of Arts and Science. Um, I would, I would like to, to talk about the law of democracy and society and talk about the, the, the ideological divide or political divide in the world and try to demonstrate how this kind of uh, divide um, yeah, have influence in the result of and the number of death uh, around the world. I will um, make an insight because the, 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 the pandemic is not finish yet so and i don't make any uh, empirical research about this subject okay but it's just an insight and i will talk about uh, and my theoretical reference here will be emil jocan a, a french sociologist who in uh, his died in 1970 and and professor uh, Emil Jacquin, and the, the, one of the most important sociologists around the world, they talk about the suicide, the, 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 the seminar um, book and over of, of, of Professor uh, Emil Jacquin. They talk about the suicide, and uh, he used the, 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 and the, 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 the research, yeah, and yeah? um, the first is that most important, he said that he said that the most important is the institutions. Uh, he put the subject of the study in the institutions. Uh, it means beliefs and models of behavior situated by the collectivity. Um, and, and study the phenomenon attributed to the society at large rather than specific actions of individuals. Uh, it is the one, one of the most important architects architect of modern social sciences. Um, in suicide, he's talk about the four kind of suicide, the egoistic suicide, the altruistic suicide, the anomic suicide, and the fatalistic suicide. Um, the egoistic suicide and uh, anomic suicide has in common uh, the low level of social integration, a lot of division. And the altruistic suicide and factorist suicides uh, talk about the, the too much social integration, too much uh, rules and the everyday life, the routine um, in case of fatalist suicide. And he had a lot of conclusion, but it's not important now. What I would try to, to make a, a, this insight is that and in the case of Brazil, for example, Brazilian uh, is agree over everything for, from eating out the restaurant to reopen schools. Uh, 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 no country was a political was politically divided over its government ranking of of the outbreak as Brazil. Brazil is a Brazil. United States is the, probably the most divided the countries in the world. Um, shut down, for example, now the restaurants, stores and other public space around the country closing the doors. Most show, uh, uh, most saw COVID-19 as a serious economic threat to the nation. And is a, 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 a disagreement between the Brazilian uh, on the effects of the pandemic among workers with lower incomes and less formal schooling. And is there a lot of div division between the government measures, restrictions, uh, uh, the dispute over shutdown, social distancing, and mask pointing to partisan different uh, over whether the country should place greater, greater emphasis on stopping the spread of the virus, of the virus, or on her starting the economy. It is the, the, the center of the is division. And for the sake of the economy, uh, this kind of place should open 
up even without the significant reductions in infections? It's a question. Social distancing were helping to reduce the spread of the virus a lot. A growing number of cases was primarily a result of increased testing. For this reason, the Brazilian government do not test your people. The president of Brazil said that a lot of um, events without mask, uh, without people around, uh, join people and say that mask is not good, that, uh, and he is very worried about the economy. I think that the economy is more important than the life of the people. Um, the school closed, it, I mean, it's, too, is a, is a problem. In Brazil, people say the, the, it's not good for education. Brazil has a, a lot of problem with educational level. Um, and for this reason, Brazil today is the between the most populous country, the first one in death per million ranking, more than United States. So we can say the ranking Brazil is the first, United States the second, Mexico, Russia. And so it's showed that the political division and ideological division contribute because you have um, some kind of uh, anomic deaths. We have, we have a lot of rules. We have a lot of rules with the pandemic, a lot of restrictions, uh, uh, too much social regulations. At the same time, we have um, insufficient social regulation because the far right government in Brazil said that uh, it's the, the real men do, don't have fear of COVID and most to uh, face this pandemic. Uh, for this reason, um, some people do not use masks, do not uh, stay in isolation, do not respect the, the rules, and a lot of people die and spread the virus. So it is the, uh, we have millions of deaths in Brazil. So we have at the same time, the egoistic, and the altruistic death. Altruistic because pe people of far right um, uh, agree with the, this ideological behavior of the, our president that say you have to face the pandemic uh, because they have a sense of belonging in this ideology, ideology. So people People, people will agree with the president and people do not respect the rules of, and restrictions and, and to uh, avoid the, the, the pandemic spread, okay? And for the, at, at the same time, people live in a, 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 a lot of restrictions with your freedom of uh, 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 in, in your liberty, and freedom of, of gold ever, for everywhere. So we have a lot of problem in this guy. So I, it's not a, 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 a empirical research, it's just the second hand um, sources. When I try to demonstrate that countries uh, where political divide is so strong, um, uh, the government measure is not respected. And so we have most people die encountering us, Brazil, United States, Mexico, Russian, Indonesian, and India.
it is my contribution. And thanks to Professor Saulo, thanks to my fellows of World Academy of Arts and Science. Thank you, dear Elon. Maybe India is the Brazil nowadays. I believe that the data are not so This is a, a, a more a formation for six years ago. Oh, six days ago. Week, week, six days six ago. Six days ago. Look at yeah. how the pandemic could be, be changeable. Well, thank you, dear Elon. Thank you for your presentation. I, I as we have... Uh, uh, seven speakers. I would like not comment all the presentations. I would like to introduce to you Alessia Malacan from Italy. She will speak about ecosphere, biosphere, infosphere, the new structure of context. And Alessia is a senior researcher at the Centre Georges Simel in the PhD at the University of Paris, Panthéon Sorbonne, and the Col des Etudes en Sciences Sociales. She's visiting professor in Porto Alegre in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, her research activities focus on philosophical aspects of revolution through the epochs and struggles of European resistance in the contemporary ages and today. So, Alessia, where are you? Yes, I can see you now. She will be visiting professor at the Federal University of the Year as soon as possible or so. So, Alessia, please, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to the speakers. And uh, good morning or good evening, everybody. If there is something we can be sure of about uh, the whole thing called pandemic, is that what comes next will be different. Different from and then before. So for the purpose of the didactical nature of the current note, globalization and the effect of the post-world Cold War. What is also presented as a new world order, whatever that formula could mean actually in the different contexts, from the fight against global terrorism to the ascension of that Washington consensus that is so hard for the leading subjects to concretize in action. So different from and then, what this pandemic was meant to be in its first coming out. Briefly, one of the worst effects of the crisis of globalization a very short time alleged to imply the crisis of USC hegemony the, gover the government proved itself to be vulnerable one more time, incapable of facing the health and symbolic crisis embodied in the virus, as it was an expected terrorist attack. As well as different from what meant to be for the future, both in politics and society, in culture and economy, in imaginary and symbolic dimension. There is in a gross draft the second Cold War as an info war. So as my colleagues openly draft an outlook for the future and the world to come, I'm here uh, devoted to bring a brief survey on over what the future will be different from. As it should be clear enough that the vision of the pandemic should not debut with the patient zero striking and should not see the curtain down with the last patient, patient dismissal. Pandemic does not fall from the sky, uh, nor does it come out from the hell. Pandemic, just like other serious attacks, contagion, or terrorism, live within our societies and are calmly sitting among us, just waiting for the right time to show up. This pandemic view of the world provoked by the virus or by an act of the so-called sharp power, the most dangerous product of the new global order, is entirely on us our fault, our responsiveness. So firstly, there is no doubt that we did not see it coming. We, whoever or whatever this we is, did not provide for a correct forecast. Even the well-known report for the CIA presented some years ago by Alexander Adler ignored the real impact of the pandemic. Secondly, if we did see that some kind of health crisis was about to come on scene, we did not see what was really coming. 
The pandemic, to the some authors referred to, is not the current pandemic, whose disease is better known under the acronym COVID-19. This pandemic is not a medical event, nor a healthcare event, or a widespread research platform engaging vaccine strategies and antiretroviral pharmacotherapy. This coronavirus pandemic event is a social, cultural, political, symbolic phenomenon, and a complex one. Not only has it engaged governmental strategies of health protection based on the conclusion of personal liberties and human rights, where it is the word human at the stake in this very context, but it has implied the complete restructuration of the state institution, such as the intelligence agencies. So the first process was already tested in a softer way during the Western rediscovery of terrorism in the opening of the century, see the Ground Zero attack 2001. The second process was put under examination too. Soon after the end of the first Cold War, 1989-1922, and before the opening of the second Cold War, 2008, and the financial crisis. The latter being marked by the spreading of a three-actor stage, US, China, and Russia. Almost a 20 year span, including the momentary lapse of reason, consisting on the rebirth of the terrorist phenomenon and threat, of course, and at the turn turning of the century. Not only were the traditional freedoms and guarantees uh, suspended and put in the background, but also they lost their constitutional rights that had been placed at the top of the legal political order. The new world order, the order of the end of bipolar equilibria and the rise of globalization and geopolitics was not much of an order, despite the interested enthusiasm of the many believers and the interest superficiality of the many criticists. The binomial forces of market and empire being the misled standpoint of the actual chaos to come. Whatever be the credo, this crisis will forever alter the vision and the practices of the so-called world order, as Kissinger summarized. So after the pandemic, nothing's going to be the same then. How many times have we listened to this sentence? Meaning perhaps that capitalist order is going to be globally upset by this pandemic? And what if it could find a better way to achieve its result? On the other hand, meaning perhaps in slavery, Jesus own words, that what we need is a new socialist shake of the world for the new post-pandemic order to come? And what if these new socialist trends were in fact some kind of new authoritarian sets or worse, a path to a new conformism based on fear and paranoia? So none of those simplification helps. The world is not about to be shaken by the pandemic. It is just going to achieve a consolidation and affirmation of the last two decennial trends. Some brilliant observers have correctly recalled Sarajevo 1914. On the other hand, if we assumed that the recent pandemic is a tragic effect of the criminal, fatal, lethal strategies of capitalism and its order, we should also assume that the pandemic itself is a sort of capitalist product, meaning struggle oligopolies, that is this time medical and biological ones, disinformation misleading facts, marking the specific info war, geopolitical trends toward an assessment of the checks and balances among the three powerful empires, each so different from the others in their political economic strategies. On this plan, the current coronavirus plague is also a financial disease, a serious one, much more than the subprime crisis in 2008 a military opportunity as for the battlefield edification geopolitical relations and a social cultural plague having the purpose unintentional as, be, as it may be of depressing the best resources in the community and the reshaping of territorial attitudes all over the world. So Latin American literature offers perspective provide a deep insight into the contradiction of the global system, call it world order or not. In this ongoing debate, we will find, uh, we will find out that the search for a vaccine could be a war, both cultural and financial, or that the pandemic could evolve toward both negative and positive feedbacks. The first implying a dynamics of crisis to be stepped over, 
The second, looking at the catastrophe to come. Finally, we can make ourselves the example of how the ponds through different systems will work instead of the limes. In Europe, the prestigious Le Monde Diplomatique a few days after the end of the first lockdown, offered a comprehensive formula stating emergence sanitaire, réponse sécuritaire, that we can translate now by health, urgency, authoritarian insurgencies. Meaning that for Europe, the case of pandemic was also a democratic case, which implied a rapid crisis of democracy, freedom, and fundamental rights, even without an increased protection of social rights. When we first spoke of the new Cold War in the terms of three actor stage in Salvador de Bahia in April 2020, in Naples and in various radio interviews during last summer, it was news. Now political observers are seriously taking into account that the pandemic and the vaccines are a real perspective for a new Cold War, one with democracy and human rights crisis, meaning that an authoritarian political view becomes systemic during the pandemic where limitation of human rights and democracy is even justified by health emergency. It becomes system because no democracy invested the resources implementing our healthcare system. So after pandemic, the second Cold War, war will be become a three-actor stage, definitely US, China, and Russia. None of them be isolated from the context, none of them being holistic and contradictory inside of it. China being in this context a latecomer, given of a particular resilience and capacity of reinventing its role and the political aspects of its global dominance. After pandemic, no illusion that the soft power, which marked the first Cold War, War of Spies and Info War, as well as cultural war, is now becoming a sharp power this information and cyber attacks be only the more visible strategies applied without even mentioning the many financial results and the perspective, of state, and, and the perspective of state failure of and the national economy default. So after pandemic, the military approach, for instance, the policies of constant repeated lockdowns and the withdrawal of the principle of self-defense as a person in the community more than as human being in danger, we reduce the space for self-enhancement as a part of the social body. What Foucault called somatocracy being the other side of what Foucault called the mandatory principle of social protection for the founder of the society more than the individual. After pandemic, on the one hand, we should reasonable trust science and research because the biggest result of pandemic in the US is that the Emory Hospital in Atlanta, maybe one of the most important center for virology and epidemiology all over the world, worked for free in order to cure as many patients as possible, 2,000 deaths, over 10 million inhabitants. While in Lombardia, which is the richest county in Italy, 20,000 deaths were recorded over 10 million inhabitants because of the fact that in the first 30 days of pandemic, more than 3,000 art, 3, articles were written for peer review medical publication. What is important here is the ongoing of scientific debate, just like as for peace and justice, what is important is, is the ongoing political and legal debate, share, always sharing a redefined paradigms on the one hand. After pandemic, on the other hand, we should distrust the big data approach. Both the national secret services, they prove their structural functional unaccountability, and by governmental ad hoc commission expertise committees, they prove their incapacity of prevention, of contention, as well as risk containment. So after pandemic, we should not be naive. Nothing has changed. Less than anything else, the virus strategy celebrating its 8 million years of cohabitation with our species and its ancestors, mostly years of cooperation for the sake of coevolution instead of mutual destruction. What is going to happen is a kind of restyling, in very, very short words, a little more aggressive China for a more vulnerable Western world. During another great plague of the past years, whose effects are still acting in different countries, a singer named Billie Holiday wrote a very beautiful song, whose lyrics are those that follow. Them that God shall have, them that's not shall lose. So the Bible says it still is news. Mama may have, 
Papa may have, but God, bless the child that God is on, that God is on. Seventh Avenue, New York City, May 9, 1941. 80 years ago, the plague was a combination of war, world war, racism, poverty, discrimination, lack of social services, drugs abuse, police abuses, depression, epidemic in the cities, stagnation economy, renewed trust in military solutions, hope for the new European colonization, lower life expectancies, streptomycin therapy just introduced in anti-TB treatment, immigrant and black soldier in the army. Then that's called shall have, then that's not shall lose, but God bless the child, that's God is on. Thank you. I'm very, very <laughs> quickly. <laughs> thank you, thank you, dear. Let's uh, respect the time. Thank you for that. And uh, you expressed the vision from Italy, of course. Uh, we have now a vision from Bucharest, Romania, uh, from our uh, Oana Branda. Thank you to come, uh, Miss. Juana. Juana is a lecturer in international relations at the Universitat Tito Maioresco, Bucharest, Romania. And we'll join us. She works with a new Constantinescu at the Levant Institute, right? So, uh, know or read about the World Academy and join us with this effort. At the end, we will stay with Winston Nagan, the last one speaker. We we'll speak after her. So, Ms. Juana, the floor is yours. Thank uh, you, you, you speak uh, about law, democracy, and society. Yes, um, it's a bit of a combination. Actually, it's going to be a presentation. I will start my share screening. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, good day, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Um, and um, apart from my job as a lecturer at uh, a private university in Bucharest, I'm also working as an expert at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Levant Culture and Civilization, which works as a functions as a center of excellence for the World Academy of Art and Science. And um, as uh, some of you are familiar, uh, my presentation derives a bit from uh, both my jobs, my work as a uh, lecturer and my work as an expert at the Institute, because at the Institute, some of you may be familiar with it, as you have been our contributors, uh, we are uh, having a project, an ongoing project dedicated to what the world will like will look like after the pandemic it's entitled the world post uh, covid 19 pandemic a humanist vision for a sustainable development and through uh, the the project was launched um last year at the beginning of may 2020 and it's uh, going to be ended this summer with a volume that we have been uh, uh, vigorously working on trying to put together all the contributions along with the context and uh, some uh, some analysis analysis, uh, which we hope to be printed during the uh, summer and made available to, to everyone interested. But uh, as I said, I am uh, also drawing on my work as a lecturer because I, uh, I teach international relations. So my presentation today will be um, focused on the post-pandemic world from the international relations perspective. What I'm trying to, to, to present today is how state leadership and um, uh, demo law, state leadership, democracy have been affected from an international relations perspective. Because both as a lecturer and as an expert at the Institute, I have been focusing my research on, on what has been um, done, uh, focusing on uh, the situation before the beginning of the pandemic, during the pandemic, and the future. Uh, the post-pandemic, um, the post-pandemic, uh, the post-pandemic world. So I will go to the to the first slide. Uh, my presentation is focused on the shock of the pandemic. That means the the first moments when people became aware with uh, became aware of the pandemic and uh, the impact that it had at the moment. The shock within the pandemic. What happened during the pandemic and what is currently happening because we are still undergoing um, the the 
the third, approaching the fourth wave of the pandemic, it's still unclear there. Then I'm looking at the post-pandemic world and I am uh, ending with some um, ideas, suggestions, like a, a, a grid um, that could be implemented by states in order to, to um, improve how uh, governance, democracy and leadership work and to be able to face similar or future uh, events to the to the to the current one so going in the first stages of the pandemic the shock of the pandemic um the pandemic took everyone by surprise that is what i call the surprise factor although there have been news about um the emerging cases in china um the the remaining part of the world the uh, the west was um unaware of the potential spread of the um, of the um a disease and um, there were pessimistic visions uh, stating that this might end in uh, in an epidemic no one foresaw uh, a pandemic of this uh, dimension but um, this was the, the the issue that uh, caught everyone um, by surprise how such a disease uh, a respir respiratory syndrome uh, which is quite common in the in the southeast uh, asian countries as we shall see how did it manage to to um spread that much that is why from the surprise factor it quickly moved into what many science many specialists in international relations called it to be a transformative event because it transformed what people knew at the time uh, of economy of education healthcare, uh, state management diplomacy not to mention economy commerce transport and uh, so on it turned everything upside down we had a 180 degrees this new event changed everything, changed the way we looked at the world. It's uh, a new event in terms of the 2020s. It, uh, there have been similar pandemics before. Uh, we've got the ancient uh, pandemics. We have the 1918 uh, Spanish flu and uh, also the more recent uh, types of epidemics. But there is a big difference between epidemic and pandemic. Um, also, there has been uh, a question uh, that has been uh, mentioned by uh, by many uh, who focused on the issue of international relations, whether this is a black swan or not. And uh, there have been so many articles that uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb actually wrote a reply to all of them stating that this is not a black swan. A black swan, if you're familiar with the concept, focuses on a sort of event that could not be predicted, that creates massive disruption and and that um, we start theorizing after the end of it. Uh, in this case, the only um, uh, feature that um that could be applied is the the mass disruption that was caused by the uh, pandemic it's not an event that could not be foreseen because um actually taleb was um predicting in early january 2020 he was predicting uh that if uh, states are not working towards containing the epidemic they will spend billions of dollars dealing with its um with aftershocks uh, and it happened. He was actually, actually right. After overcoming the surprise factor, after acknowledging that we are dealing with a transformative event, um, states and uh, state leaders had to uh, strategize. They had an immediate urge, an immediate need to strategize and mitigate the, mitigate the losses. Uh, because the most impressive um, aspect of this pandemic, it's not its nature, it's not the cause, the manifestation. We had previous pandemics. But what surprises, we also had previous uh, large number of deaths um, in comparison to the current la uh, number of deaths um, in, uh, in history. But what is striking about this event is um, the very vulnerabilities that it, uh, it, it, it uh, affected. It, uh, it had a direct impact on those very vulnerabilities of states and, of course, the massive um, um, and the fast uh, spread of the the, um, of the disease. I am moving next to the shock within the pandemic, which, which caused failure of strong, uh, strong important systems. And some of my um, uh, fellow uh, panelists mentioned them. We had uh, strong countries falling apart because their medical system and economic and so on systems um, 
their their systems uh failed and uh this was a major uh warning signal that um despite uh, your economic power and uh, the many resources you have at hand you are still um uh, very poor in the face of um in the face of disease and in the face of death uh, death is a certainty in these kinds of um, uh, epidemics, um, and as we have seen in the past, but um, we need to learn um, uh, from the fast pace at which uh, the, the epidemic spread and turned into a pandemic. This is an issue that we are still dealing with because, uh, for instance, we've had, after the initial uh, type of the um, disease, we had several variants. We had the uh, British variant variant of COVID. We had the um, uh, African variant. We now have the Indian variant. Uh, so um, we need to deal with these kinds of variables, the variant, the, the different types of COVID and the, uh, the rapid spread, which needs to be contained. The authorities, uh, many claim that the authorities failed to uh, provide the appropriate responses as, of course, they were taken by surprise. And uh, who are we to, to call? I have uh, ten, ten minutes. minutes. You have ten five. Minutes. You have five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, I will go faster then. Okay, so um, the the authorities failed to provide the appropriate response, which in some cases led to uh, power voids. Uh, and these power voids are the most uh, important aspects to to deal with because they create um, uh, they create uh, the um, framework for uh, coup d'état for various revolutions and massive political disruptions, which have been continuing in some of the uh, some areas of the world in as a sideshow. That's why I said the sideshow is the most consistent because uh, migration, um, the situation in Yemen or Nagorno-Karabakh, which have been ongoing for years, um, they remain somewhere in the background and they were still, uh, they were reactivated during this uh, pandemic and nothing stopped them. So they continued un, uh, unhindered. Now going towards the future, where will the pandemic lead? Um, and I was looking at the um, perspectives uh, every single month, and they changed from the beginning in you know, March and May, uh, March and April 2020 to what is now uh, the, uh, the the view. First, uh, there were opinions that a new world war will emerge. However, they were contradicted by the fact that instead uh, of war, we'll be having peace because countries countries feel that their um, economic patterns and economic um, status has been disrupted to such an extent that they cannot embark on wars. They don't have the, they no longer have the resources or the willing to spend resources on uh, on wars. So it's surprisingly, instead of war, uh, this kind of pandemic might lead to a more peaceful uh, world. We also have a deepening of existing conflicts, the ones I mentioned before, and the disruption in supply chains which does not affect only the poor countries. It will affect everyone because um, whether you are a, a powerful country with a powerful economy, you are still dependent on uh, um, on the market where you are uh, spending your, uh, when you are selling your products or on those uh, poor countries from which you extract the, the, the resources that you exploit to produce. So uh, the disruption in supply chains will be will definitely affect everyone. This is a uh, certainty. And now to end my presentation, I have uh, recorded seven steps for recovery in the past in the post pandemic world. First of all, the we are, we need to build confidence in institutions, not just national institutions, uh, but we need to work nationally as well, but also international institutions like the. Um, um, uh, the the World Health Organization, the United Nation, um, and going back to a national level, the very institutions that put in force mechanism to, mechanisms to mitigate the losses. We also need to build early warning mechanisms. Such mechanisms exist in Southeast Asian countries where this kind of respiratory syndromes are frequent. We have them in Singapore. We have them in South Korea. We need to put them in place also in our countries because this 
these kind of syndromes, these kind of diseases are no longer affecting remote areas of the world. They have the power because of uh, the um, fast circulation of people. They have the power to move quickly and affect everyone. Also, we need to establish resources for threat management. We need to have a direct connection between them uh, to have... Um, uh, resources allotted to different kinds of threats and um, we need to bring pandemics further up in the degree of threats because I was looking back at my at my country's um, security strategy and we have pandemics recorded them uh, they recorded there but not they're not major threats they are somewhere in I don't know in between vulnerabilities and risks they are more likely vulnerabilities this was the situation before COVID-19 now we we have to move them up to the major threats. Uh, also, we need to make database decisions because um, we need to act accordingly to the situation on the ground. We need not uh, focus on this might happen or this might not happen. We need to be um, aware that we need to have patterns of response uh, based on the, the data provided, the data collected on the situation at hand. Also, we need to accelerate the technological support uh, because we We've seen how, how important technology has been in, the, in this kind of um, crisis. It helped us overcome many, many difficulties. I just have two more, uh, two more uh, steps to go to and I, I am done. Uh, so we need to focus on technology because it's a major, major factor of support. Uh, it cannot replace uh, human interaction. It cannot replace uh, human activity, but it can help uh, mitigate loss. It can help overcome the, the difficulties. And of course, um, it will help us uh, recover in the, in the end. Also, we need to uh, focus on public-private cooperation. Uh, the private sector has many more resources and less um, less procedures, less bureaucracy than the than the, the public sector. So we need to have an intertwined cooperation uh, between them, so that in case of such crisis, they can uh, the the private sector can jump to the help of the uh, of the public sector. Of course, if there is uh, enough will in that regard. But we, as we have seen in the United States, they actually had uh, um, a production act um, um, enforced, which uh, somehow forced is the, the private sector to uh, co collaborate with the uh, public sector. And finally, and the most important, build resilience. Resilience, resilience, resilience. This is the, this has become the poster child, the, uh, the emblem uh, name of the COVID-19 pandemic, because resilience uh, speaks about a, an entity's capacity to bounce back from a situation that uh, destroyed uh, the initial state, affected the initial state. And um, this is the most important uh, in the uh, post-pandemic world. The world has recovered from previous pandemics. It went on, it survived. So, And they did it because uh, people and state entities were resilient. And uh, we, know, we not only... Uh, us uh, need to be resilient, but also um, um, institutions, governmental institutions all over the world, both nationally and the international institutions need to, to look resilient and uh, build on their capacity to recover and overcome this kind of uh, situation. Thank you. If you have questions, you have, uh, uh, I look forward to them in the uh, Q&A session. And also, if you need to contact me, please, you have the um, email address. Thank you. For hope. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much for your contribution to our discussions. I will not comment. I will give the floor to my friend and colleague and fellow of the World Academy, Mr. Megan. Uh, he is the last one speaker today before the, the, the debates. Uh, Professor Neger, he, you are the cherry of the cake today. Right. And uh, he will speak about the COVID-19 pandemic, global constitutionalism and human rights. He is emeritus professor of law, University of Florida, former chair of the Board of Trustees, World Academy, PhD, Yale, United States served as chair of the Amnesty International United States and president for the Science Center 
He is widely published in international law and human rights and has taught and lectured in at least 20 universities worldwide, served as acting justice on the High Court of the Cape of Good Hope, South Africa, 2006. And I probably used to make my from your admirer. Uh, you have the floor now. Thank you, Saulo, and thank you to the other distinguished panelists on this uh, rather important and uh, timely uh, uh, meeting. Um, I uh, have chosen to speak on a topic that is somewhat esoteric, and uh, in some degree in international circles, even today, is still somewhat disfavored. Uh, now, I'm not certain as to why it is uh, an unpopular topic. Maybe it's because people don't like lawyers. That's one aspect of it. Uh, but in any event, uh, it has become to me more and more and more important that the modest innovations, uh, the international community and in particular international lawyers have made since World War II have raised the importance of global constitutionalism more than national constitutionalism, global constitutionalism as a way of minimizing uh, the resort to destructive war. And in the context of evolving global constitutionalism, uh, 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 we have emerged with, if you like, the notion of an international bill of rights. And that international bill of rights is essentially the most important human rights that feed the idea of global cooperation, global understanding, and global advancement on the issues of peace. What the pandemic does is it moves us from simply the notion of peace, which is still very imperfect, to another dimension. The constitutional system that we now have really is organized around sovereign nation states with boundaries. The pandemic does not recognize boundaries. It transcends boundaries. And so the question then becomes, is there anything that we can do to constrain the advance of pandemics like this one uh, and what we can do cooperatively to reduce its impact on the survivability of mankind. And so that's where I think the challenging issue comes up. The business of global constitutionalism in the context of war and to some degree human rights is still completely uh, 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 undeveloped. It, it is not as fully developed and indeed not as popular. Uh, and so- Oh, okay, all right. And so, 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 so notwithstanding the imperfections of the global constitutional system that we now have, which is oriented to war and to a limited degree, the advancement of human rights, we now have to look at this model and see if it can be more intellectually and philosophically developed so that we can have a global constitutional system that looks at healthcare. And the most important element of healthcare is that it isn't, at least the pandemic is not constrained to a nation state. Nation state boundaries as in sovereignty are completely irrelevant. Uh, so now we've got to develop a level of uh, 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 cooperation uh, that captures two important things. It captures the interdependence of humanity and it captures the interdetermination of humanity and interdetermination and interdependence are central to the threat posed by a global pandemic such as the one we now confront and the possibility of other pandemics in the future. So uh, I wanted to just raise this question uh, because uh, it is not the case that thinking in terms of a global constitutional system is simple, but we have to start somewhere. There is no other way. If we don't have global cooperation, if we don't have uh, a, a global response and responsibility 
for the spread of diseases that might terminate humanity's existence, then we are in very, very poor shape for the human future on this planet. So the first thing I wanted to set out is that there's some obvious uh, weaknesses in the system that we now have of constitutionalism oriented around the sovereignty of the nation state. I don't want to go into the detail of it, uh, but I can, or you can email me if you want to get more on this. But the problem with sovereignty has historically been the same then as it is now. And that is the, 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 the assumption that sovereignty is unconstrained. There are no limits to what sovereigns can do. This is one of the earliest problems that international lawyers saw with sovereignty idea after 1648, when this particular model was put into effect globally. The practical problem with unconstrained sovereignty is what are the limits to war making? And what are the limits when you actually do conduct war? Where do you get the rules that constrain you from war crimes and crimes against humanity and so on. So the, the, the idea of a unconstrained sovereignty is still one of the loom, looming aspects of our current constitutional system. States are extremely reluctant to give up their powers of absolute sovereignty or sovereign absolutism. It is still a major problem. And it basically confronts the problem of sovereignty must be limited by a respect universally for human rights. So that's a, a problem still somewhat unresolved. And while we are trying to resolve this problem, we are now confronted with another problem. This is not a problem of war. This is a problem of a pandemic, a pandemic that knows no boundaries, really disrespects uh, uh, politics. And uh, it, it, its only uh, constraining force is the extent to which we can develop science, distribute science, and have science play an important role in politics and law uh, uh, and social cooperation across national and state lines. So, so uh, my suggestion is if we start, we might want to start over the idea that the current system probably uh, accentuates identity politics, generates a kind of skepticism of science, and thus possibly presents a lack of coordination or incentive to solve problems of a global nature. And quite clearly, the pandemic is a problem of a global nature. Now, the solution to this, it seems to me quite simply, is we need strengthened global coordination we need a greater reliance on science as one of the important tools for managing a global pandemic. And most importantly, from a legal or juridical point of view, we need to establish the principle of healthcare as a fundamental human rights. And the reason I say that is that if we have a fundamental human right to healthcare, we have a foundation upon which you can evolve a system of global constitutionalism that takes into account the important and critical needs of healthcare on a universal basis. Uh, now, um, in, um, uh, in, in my opinion, very briefly, uh, uh, the UN Charter constrains war, but it's not perfect. Uh, a, a, a global charter uh, to define and implement global health care will not be perfect, but you have to start somewhere and you have to learn from your errors and your science and your politics and your international relations, how far and to what extent you can effectively go to achieve the ends of, of realizing a global commitment to health care on a universal basis. Now, there are obvious failures that we can look at um, Trump's unilateral approach in the United States, the divergence and ignoring of scientific expertise simply resulted in over half a million deaths. 
we don't like to talk about it. That's bad news for the United States. But that's essentially what it left us with. The, the uh, denial of an international responsibility for the problem, the, the, the denigration and, and uh, fooling around with the importance of science. And this is, of course, meant that the United States did not play an important role in advancing the idea that we need to look at healthcare from a global point of view. Uh, the new administration has reversed uh, that policy with its vaccination program, with its effort to export vaccination, with its uh, loosening of the, uh, of the patents and so forth on healthcare. Uh, and this is a small but important start for us to collaborate on the question of how we manage pandemics. Incidentally, I do not think this is going to be the only pandemic, even in our lifetime, I think we will have more and more dangerous pandemics. Um, so uh, what I think uh, the US showed here very bluntly was that the unilateral approach, the denigration of science and uh, the approach to uh, uh, ethnic and uh, racial uh, superiority of some people uh, was simply the last possible principle you need to create a universal uh, uh, approach that could set up the constitutional standards for a global healthcare system that is effective. Uh, now, um, in my opinion, I think that uh, even for for the problems of war and peace, global constitutionalism is still one of the most important constraints on the possibility of mass destruction. Uh, but I think that the question of constitutional now needs to be more adequately developed intellectually and scientifically so that it can account for other vitally important rights that relate to the survivability of humankind. And one of those important rights is the right to health care and the protection of humanity from pandemics in the future. So in my opinion, it is absolutely important that we begin a discourse intellectually at first to be sure on the current and future challenges uh, for the future of humanity that has to rely on the question of global coordination global cooperation. I do not think we will survive without global cooperation. And therefore, I think cooperation in the context of the future of pandemics and indeed the future of such notions as uh, climate change uh, are matters that require an urgent concern for how we can constitutionalize these uh, matters so that it's not just the states. We need to marshal all the major platforms of global influence, global uh, 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 expression from the scientific, intellectual, uh, professional, business, and every community, uh, in addition to the states, uh, to somehow or other provide at a compact, however imperfect, but a compact that can evolve over time that provides humanity as a whole with a much more coordinated and uh, scientifically based uh, response to the uh, protection of humanity from the ravages of either the pandemics of the future or climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, colleague, your explanation is directly the point. And we see in this morning a lot of uh, expositions that uh, deal with uh, resilience, uh, with, uh, the fundamental right of health, economics, uh, the position of uh, the posture of governments fighting against COVID-19, and uh, the perspectives the political perspectives, the kind of lockdowns and isolation, uh, what do we have to do about it? And uh, we receive two 
considerations more than more than questions. I believe that it they are considerations about the time. I will share the text with you. One from Yo Anderson. We must be careful finding innovation from COVID-19, which seems like to validate in the disruption. And Salita Don't from Melbourne. When nations of the world empathize with each other, understanding the different variants of the pandemic, it's positive thinking and optimism that can create resilience in people of the world facing the pandemic. So I believe that there's more, more consideration that questions. Totally. And uh, I, I would like uh, I'd like to ask the panelists if they want to put something, to, to add something, to provoke another panelist. And uh, I would like to open the microphone initially to Thomas Reuter uh, to close the, the session and do some considerations and uh, pose some questions to another panelist, so please. Yes, Thomas. I think um, um, there's much in common uh, in, in what we've all said. We've looked at it from different angles, but clearly there we have some common understanding. Uh, personally, I'm very interested in what Nagan said at the end about the legal status. And, and uh, I guess uh, when we want to influence policy with science, it's not, in some ways, not real until it becomes condensed into law and regulations. And I think that's, that's why it's so interesting to me. You know, I wonder how we can bridge that gap. You know, how, you know, where are the, point, the, play, the, the acupuncture points where science can apply itself to bring about legal change? And that also goes to you, Saulo, you know, because you're also in the legal profession. Where, where can you... Um, where can you where, where can we elicit change, perhaps irrespective of the political landscape? You, Saulo, you mentioned the different perspectives of left and right wing governments. You know, how can we cut across that? You know, I mean, uh, there's also, <laughs> I mean, even on the right, you know, and we be thinking of uh, uh, Trump and, and those similar to him, you know, on their reactions. I think there's also a sort of a battle for the soul of conservatism, you know, to be to be fought and hopefully won, because conservatism is not necessarily uh, uh, not um, difficult to reconcile with, say, nature conservation or the protection of the population from disease or or education. It's, it doesn't. Re there's no necessary conflict. It's only a certain brand of, of, of politics on the right that is hostile to, to these things, you know, whether it's uh, neoliberalism or, uh, you know, Trumpist populism. So anyway, so how can we cut, can cut, how can we cut through the politics and, and get support for, for change in the legal system that would enshrine some of these rights we think people should have, you know, the right to eat, you know, the right to, to be safe, the right uh, to object to the, the sort of license nation states sometimes take in waging war or in, in failing to cooperate. How can we do that? And what, where, where, where are the leverage points? Yeah, that's a good question. I believe that the uh, right or left uh, are a force that at present at the same time, at the same place, they are working always together, the conservatives and the liberalists and, uh, and the, the, the more fraternal solidarity, they are working together always. I believe that a lot of the answer or the issue would be a mental disposition, and, uh, internal, belief about uh, how to live in a society, what to do, want to. 
to prefer, what we want to protect, what to, how do you feel the, the others, I, I think. But let, 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 let me hear Sergio Bittar, please. Please, Mr. Sergio, it's an honor to receive you today and stay with us from Santiago, Chile. Yes, thank you, Saulo. Let me uh, concentrate my remark on, on this connection between global constitutionalism and national constitutions. Because uh, the issue of human rights and global cooperation must be also be founded in, in national constitution building. Uh, if you have strong state with democracy and respect of human rights, it's much easy to move towards a global constitutionalism that strengthen human rights and cooperation. And I think we have now a big option to do that. But the connection between the two is very important. Weak states, populist states, will not promote nor defend global constitutionalism. So this connection, I think, it should be developed more. And in particular, in this case, I want to mention my, my country. We are having elections this weekend. We're having for the first time in our history, uh, the election of members of a constitutional assembly. The first time in our history that we are going to elaborate the new constitution democratically, not imposed. The last one was imposed by Pinochet. The, the, the members are half women, half men, and that was established. So it's the first uh, consti uh, constitution uh, assembly with this characteristic of parity in gender in the world for the first time. So, and we are facing a situation, we don't know how to, where that will lead us, where we have two factors playing at the same time a big social movement before the pandemic, fighting against inequality and discrimination and the need for social mobility. It's a typical Latin American problem. And the need for a new constitution to redefine human rights, to redefine rights in general, socioeconomic rights, to redefine the role of the native people to redefine the role of the presidential system versus a semi-presidential system and many other things. So it would, it's worth monitoring this process because the way this country faces this issue, I think will have lots of influence in the rest of Latin America. We just are seeing in Colombia, the same process that happened in Chile or similar in terms of social protest institutions that are narrow and do not channel social social movement and social development. So this connection between, that's my point, global constitutionalism and national changes in constitutions in the line that you have been mentioning and I uh, emphasized before, I think it's a very important topic, especially in Latin America, at least our region. Yes, I, I agree completely with you. We need a, like a Verfassungsville, as the, the German speak, uh, human rights will be that it's a mental disposition. And uh, I would like to, to share the floor with Edon. Please, Edon. Um, Professor Saul, uh, um, I think that will be a, a um, it will be a, a, a change in the law after this pandemic um, to face. Um, the problems of the populism or the right of the left, you know, Mexico or United States or Brazil. Um, and we will need a, a real um, um, uh, law reform and the penal code to avoid that uh, the new uh, pandemic that we will face in the next years. Uh, so I, I think the, the legislative in Brazil and, and all, all, uh, around the world, uh, it's necessary to make a real change in the law 
to face the new pandemic. I, I think that it will be a change in, in, in the world, in the educational system. It will be a change in, 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 in every aspect of the uh, 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 our world. Yeah. It, it's, it's a lot of change we, we will face. But the international law, tools law to must, fight against. Uh, law must response is this these problems to avoid that the new uh, pandemic uh, less people um, die and the way it, it, it was I think uh, I would like to to solidarize with people around the world a lot of people die a lot of millions of people die millions of family uh, lost your parents your relatives so it would be a tragedy for the world and the law, the political most response, but the law most response to uh, this changement of the mind and, 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 and understand that ideology and his system of closed mind, it's not compatible with pandemic, okay? Thank you very much. And Alessia, do you speak from Rome or from Napoli or from Paris? Now from Naples, the south of Italy. Naples, south of Italy. Please, uh, or, uh, your considerations, please. Thank you. There is a lot of interesting subjects. And uh, if should I speak my mind, I'd like to say that uh, there are two answers a political answer and a scientific answer. Uh, the scientific answer that <laughs> is that we, are, we have a crisis of paradigms and uh, we should uh, consider the problematic uh, interaction between, uh, for example, biosphere and ecosphere, which have different sets of laws of functioning, uh, complexity as far as the uh, biosphere is concerned, and uh, competition as far as ecospheres concerned. And these sets of law um, are uh, in contradiction um, among them. And now we should add the destructive activity of an infosphere. That is to say, uh, entropy, disorder, amount of information that we have to administrate, we have to keep. Because this information domain is growing threat and has already produced um, three subdomains. The first is that uh, I called uh, sociology of catastrophe. Think, of, think about uh, uh, new urban ecology and the vision of the city as the possible art of the community. Mm. Secondly, there is a catastrophe policy marked by the conflict uh, between freedoms and rights, as well as between the obligation of the state, the requirements of scientific research, and between the emergence of health and the security response. And finally, we point out the symbolism of the catastrophe. This is mainly linked to the incomprehension of the extent of the body paradigm, paradigm in its complexity. But politically answer is that we are living into the third cold war. There is a, there is a three actor stage as uh, I said before, China, Russia, and USA. While the first Cold War was characterized by soft power, the second Cold War was characterized by sharp power, which is both information warfare and trade warfare. So it is this contest of the second Cold War and sharp power that the recent pandemic vision is born. And in my opinion, this pandemic vision leads to a decisive accentuation of this scenario in which the new Cold War be not only military uh, research, but also bacteriological, virological research, especially on vaccine. But just uh, uh, less uh, thing, for instance, in this new scenario, an important trend could be uh, the cooptation of the intelligence agencies within the government and the administration, just like in Italy, uh, where four key ministers come directly from intelligence agencies. And the USA, when the new secretary of the state comes directly from military uh, security agencies. Same for justice, but 
it will take uh, us too far. So this is why I think we need to redefine the methodology for this new Cold War. This is my uh, obse yeah. observation view. Yeah, thank you. And thank research. you, thank you, Alessa. Thank you. Yes, yes, resources about it. Thank you, thank you. And Ana, please, uh, your considerations. Well, um, there's, there are so many topics that um, need to be tackled in this uh, post-pandemic uh, world, but uh, the issue of law is especially important because it creates the framework for the functioning of both states and international organizations. However, it's a very slippery slope there because um, working in the field of law and trying to, uh, uh, to regulate from a law perspective all the more the future situations, because it's most certain, as my fellow panelists said, we will be dealing Dealing with other pandemics, we will be dealing with serious issues in the future, uh, of which climate change is the most featured right now. Uh, but um, it's a very slippery slope to to go to uh, when uh, regulating everything, because this might um, lead to abuses. And we've had these accusations raised in the past months with states which have abused the state of emergency or the state of alert and imposed uh, various regulations, fines, all sorts of legislative um, measures that affected and infringed upon people's rights. So um, <laughs> I agree with Sergio, who mentioned earlier that we need a new social contract. Yes, we need a new social contract because the previous one has been breached by states. States failed to provide uh, for their citizens, failed to provide in the field of healthcare, failed to provide in the field of education, in the field of economy. Uh, even from a legislative point of view, for instance, in Romania, we had in the months of uh, the state of emergency, we had so many fines imposed on people, abusively imposed on people who uh, on one account or another uh, overstep the curfew. We had these uh, late night curfews. You had to be at home by nine or something. I think it was nine. Yeah, nine or ten a year ago. Now we have it ten. We still have a curfew to be at home by ten. Um, um, with the exception of some cases which are regulated by a statement that you have to have with you uh, if you are out uh, after the, the curfew hour. And there have been cases uh, in, in which illegal abuse abuses, uh, not, not legal, legally uh, enforced abuses have been, um, uh, have been uh, performed. So that is why we need a new social contract. We need, uh, we need to consult the people. Uh, I will refer and draw on an, uh, an initiative that has been going since, um, since Sunday, uh, on the 9th of May, the U European Union launched the uh, conference on the future of Europe which is a digital platform uh, asking the people to provide response and feedback on how they see the future of Europe, how should the European Union be reformed from a structural point of view. That should be performed in this case also. States, leaders, uh, governments need to consult the people because it is the very people that have been affected by the pandemic. We talk in terms of states, we talk in terms of economics, but all these are in fact people. So we need to consult the people and get feedback from them and see what needs to be improved in the future so that when we deal with another pandemic, which will be totally different from this one, because although history has a habit of repeating itself, each and every um, uh, event is different from the previous one, we may have patterns, but they will differ from one event to another. But we need to, to ask the people and have their feedback on uh, what could be better done in the future uh, so that they feel protected, because this is essentially the role of the state to provide and protect for, for, uh, for its citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alana. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll talk about very important things. And uh, Professor Nega, you did the last one. The uh, final words will belong to you. Please, uh, I would like, we uh, need to hear you about your considerations, please. Right. Uh, uh, yes, uh, my final words are I was extremely impressed with the insights that the panelists provided on this important topic. I think we've certainly 
moved uh, the um, the pendulum on this, uh, I uh, uh, appreciated the comments from several of your speakers on the importance of trying to find a, a, a theory and method for a new form of constitutionalism on, a global, on a global basis. basis. Uh, that certainly is work that uh, is incomplete, even from the perspective of those of us who are experienced in uh, jurisprudence, which is the theory of law. But what we see more and more is the importance of uh, global interdependence and interdetermination. And uh, uh, an event such as the pandemic has only underscored the idea that our forms of constitutionalism based on physical boundaries are just no longer adequate uh, to secure the safety and future of humanity. So what I can only say is that we, we have a challenge to have a deeper understanding of what constitutive processes really are understand the interrelationship of constitutive processes at the national level and constitutive processes at the global level and the extent to which they are intertwined with each other and help to facilitate uh, the advancement of human rights and human dignity on a universal basis. That remains a challenge, uh, not just for lawyers, but for all of those who want to see a real change and real progress that secures the human future, uh, 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 that secures the human future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Winston. What to say more than you told to us. And uh, I would like to, to see hello to Itogo Pulino. He finally uh, arrived here at our, our room after some difficulties to join using the Zoom, but he's now he's here. Hello, but let, let, let's go ahead. I would like to, to congratulate uh, all of you. You were brilliant today. And uh, I would like to say uh, thank you. And tomorrow we we'll start, we'll start, we'll start soon, sooner, sooner, nine o'clock, nine o'clock tomorrow morning with uh, the panel Education, Science and Innovation. Andrew Savedla will be the moderator and we will discuss. We'll have a break uh, 10 and a half. And after the session three, we continue to discuss Education, Science and Innovation, part two, uh, 11 o'clock. So nine o'clock tomorrow, uh, be safe. See you tomorrow. We will close the, the, the panel and the seminar for today. Thank you very much.